the sanctification that comes from serving. And I would hope that all who are in Christ here tonight have this common goal, that our goal ultimately, or one of our goals, is to be sanctified, is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, is to become more like Jesus Christ. This is what Romans chapter 8 tells us should be a major emphasis of our Christian walk, is to become like Jesus Christ. And I've communicated this in various different ways before, but I want to say it again, is that you don't want to look at deliverance as like some separate movement or separate experience outside of your sanctification. A lot of people separate the two. They don't associate with uh, deliverance with being a part of your sanctification, but it is actually. So many times when you're asking the question, how can I get delivered? You could simultaneously or reframe the question and ask, how can I become sanctified? And when you do that, the deliverance will come naturally many times. And, and what I want to say is that some of the most of the, uh, of, of the sanctification, or in other words, deliverance you are looking for, will come when you are serving God. And I wanted to address this as well, too, because many people still bring this up to me sometimes. They'll say, I need to get fully delivered before I can step into my calling. I want to make sure every demon is completely gone, that there's no demonic attack in my life or no deliverance I'll need anymore before I step into my calling. But you actually want to have the opposite mentality. I'm not saying to ignorantly rush into ministry that you're not prepared for, but actually a lot of the deliverance you're looking to receive will come uh, when, when you step out in faith and do God's will. And I would bring a, an example to you guys that Paul said that he needed deliverance in the New Testament in 2 Timothy chapter 4, in Romans chapter 7, Paul communicated that he needed spiritual deliverance in some sense. Um, and, and for those who are not familiar with Romans chapter 7, just as a side note, many people will say Romans chapter 7 is talking about Paul before he was converted. But this is not the case because in Romans chapter 7 verse 22, Paul said, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Paul is affirming two things right here that he delights in the true will of God, and that his inward man is regenerate. Obviously, because he's saying he delights in the law of God in the inward man, that wouldn't be possible if he was not yet born again, right? So you can go to that verse right there and say, how is Paul talking about before he was converted if he's delighting in the law of God in his spirit man, right? But anyways, aside from that point, I just wanted to bring up the Paul situation to give a scriptural precedent or example for what I'm talking about. If Paul said that he needed deliverance in some regard, then obviously Paul was used by God so much, how could we not think that we can be used by God? So if you want to grow in Christ and if you want to get deliverance, minister to people. Think about it, guys. What many times brings about the most uh, anxiety, insecurity, fear, blockages to arise with inside of you internally? is when you step out to serve God, when you step out to do God's will. I know that's definitely been the case in my walk. What causes darkness to surface the most, most of the time, is when I'm planning to go do God's will, when I'm planning to evangelize, when I'm planning to, you know, preach a message, whatever it might be, right? Now, obviously, God grows you out of that, and that's my whole point. But um, the things that cause the most darkness to surface are actually the things that are going to cause you to grow the most. You know, if you're going to try to do something that's God's will, and it's causing your flesh to react in a way where darkness is surfacing, look at it as God's going to use this to sanctify me a lot. You can flip it on its head and think of it in that way. This is going to bring about a lot of sanctification in actuality, even if you don't see it right there in that very moment. Because... You can also reframe this as well, too. It's going to require a lot of self-denial. If something causes a lot of darkness to come to the surface that you have to resist, it also is thus going to require a lot of self-denial. And when you deny yourself, you grow in Christ. I wanted to read to you guys John chapter 4, verse 31. It says, In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, 
Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. So think about that last statement right there, guys. Jesus is saying in some sense, spiritual nourishment comes through serving God, comes through accomplishing the will of God for your life. Literally, like you literally spiritually get nourished through accomplishing God's will. Do you guys know something that's spiritual is not necessarily not literal, right? Like we're God's children. We literally are God's children, even though it's a spiritual truth. Spiritual truths are actually literal, FYI, in case you guys didn't know. When these spiritual truths are stated about Christians, they're not just metaphorical language. They're truths, but they're spiritual, so you might not see them in a tangible sense in the physical, but they nevertheless are a literal truth. But nevertheless, getting back to my point, um, you know, Jesus is even saying right here that doing God's will could nourish you so much that you don't even need to eat physical food. Why is Jesus uh, denying the offer to eat food in this situation? Because the nourishment that comes from serving God can, can fill you so much. Now, obviously, it's not merely that, but that is a big part of it. That's where I can attribute a lot of my spiritual growth, a lot of my sanctification that I've gone through in my walk by God's grace is by serving others. And you know what's a prime environment for a pharisaical spirit to arise in your heart? Me and another minister were just talking about this in some sense before this meeting began, is you receive a lot of revelation, you receive a lot of knowledge, and you sit on it. You sit on it and you don't ever minister to people. You need to watch out in a situation like that because now you're gaining all this discernment and revelation, but you don't ever put it into practical use and thus gain compassion, understanding, mercy. You're not using those revelations in a way where you operate in the fruit of the Spirit if you don't ever step out and serve God with the revelation that God has given you. You don't ever learn that uh, that mercy, that understanding, that compassion, like I said, and it can be prime for a Pharisee, uh, Pharisaical spirit start to arise, to start to arise in your heart as a result. It goes on to say, Say not uh, ye there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. This is what Jesus Christ is saying about preaching the kingdom of God, about evangelizing to others. Don't say there's a particular time to harvest. Don't say there's a particular time to serve God. No, be instant in season and out of season. Think of that last statement right there, guys. Look on the fields. They are white, uh, white and ready to harvest. They are already ready to harvest. You know, many people talking about a pharisaical spirit can enter into this state where like, man, th this world's so lost, and it is, and can be like so many people today are so wicked, and they are, don't get me wrong, but have a negative mentality like God isn't working, God isn't moving. But God is saving a lot of people today, actually. I believe God the Father is always drawing people because Jesus Christ is saying that the fields are ready to harvest at any given time. It doesn't matter the month of the year, right? It doesn't matter the time of the year. God is always drawing people and there is a harvest that is ready to be harvested. You just have to look in the right places and move with God's spirit and step out in faith. Here's the thing as well too, like a lot of you know ministers or a lot of Christians in general might think that God is not on the move, but they're not on the move. If, you, if you're not on the move, you're not going to see God on the move, right? But God is always drawing people. Romans chapter 5 verse 20 says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abound, grace did much more abound. Don't ever be discouraged about, you know, the, the wickedness that is increasing in this world. We should be discouraged in some sense, like sad for people, upset that the devil's taking advantage of them. But nevertheless, you know, the more darkness that you're involved in prior to your salvation, the more intense your conversion will be when you become born again, the more love you'll have for God. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what some condition somebody is in 
actually sometimes when they reach the depths of darkness, they're actually more open to coming to God. Luke chapter 7 verse 47 says, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. If you're forgiven a lot, you will instinctively, inherently love God more when you become born again. There will be a particular grace on your life, more so in some sense, when you become born again, the more of the, of the depths of sin that you were saved out of, right? But going back to the main thrust of this message, uh, like I said, some of the most deliverance and sanctification I got was when I stepped out of faith, when I started making YouTube videos, when I started street preaching, when I started doing deliverance calls with people. Um, I can, I can, you know, very uh, particularly look back when I first started doing those things, and I didn't realize it at the time. Catch that again. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was growing so much actually in that situation. And what growth brings about is deliverance. Like I said, don't look at deliverance as some separate experience from your sanctification. They are coupled in with each other. You guys want to know? I was going to bring up this testimony. The first time I ever did deliverance on somebody over a video call, the person literally interrupted me in, in the middle of the deliverance prayer, just to bring some, you know, humility to myself or however you want to say it. If some of you, you know, might look like I'm, I'm you know, obviously I can do thorough deliverance. The first time that I did deliverance prayer on somebody over video call, that is, I had done deliverance prior to this, he literally stopped me in the middle of the prayer and said, Noah, I don't think this is working. Man, couldn't that, I don't know, maybe there was like still some ignorance left over from when I was lost. For some reason, that really didn't discourage me a lot. But imagine if I would have let that discourage me. I wouldn't be where I'm at today, not by any any means, not even necessarily close. Um, so many times as well, too, when you step out in faith for the first time, the devil throws you a curveball. So there's a, a side note. If you do step out in faith and ministry to a new capacity, many times the devil throws you a curveball. But I continue to press in by God's grace. And, you know, the Lord really brought me a lot further than that, obviously. But, man, that could be discouraging if you take that experience at face value right there. You know, and it's interesting. It's not coincidental. That's the only time I've ever had that happen after thousands of deliverances I've done. It was on the first one that I did online, at least. I wanted to bring up this concept to you guys again in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. It says that Jesus Christ said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. I want you guys to uh, let that concept sink in to your spirit, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is the mentality that we should have as Christians, and not for some arbitrary reason. You know, it's not like it's pointless. For it to be more blessed to give than to receive it literally is more blessed to give than to receive why because of who it makes you to be who it causes you to be you know when you give to others when you bless others when you minister to others is so monumental in your sanctification right i mean there's many different reasons but uh you know something that i say to people sometimes after i've done deliverance on them they'll say thank you or something like that and I'll say, I thank God for the opportunity to do the deliverance. I feel blessed by God to have the opportunity to be able to pray for you. It's a blessing for me to be able to do this in the first place, right? Like, I'm blessed, maybe just as much, or maybe in some sense even more sometimes, right? Now, I'm not saying ministry is easy on the flesh. I'm not saying that every time you minister, like, it's just going to be a joyful experience or anything like that. But at the end of the day... I mean, it is more blessed than uh, to give than to receive, right? Nevertheless. So, yeah, I say that to people sometimes, right? And as a Christian, you know, we should look at the opportunity to serve to be greater in our minds than to, to be served. I mean, obviously, you want both. You want to receive ministry as well, too. You don't want to always just serve for people on the other end of the spectrum. Sometimes you need to slow down and receive from others. But I think more pe more people are on the opposite end of the spectrum, where right, where they're receiving, but they're not giving. But it's actually more blessed. If you could catch that, it's more blessed to give than to receive. 
and not because of selfishness where you want to exalt yourself or be in the spotlight or you know have this you know tell people what to do or whatever but i wanted to read to you guys mark chapter 10 verse 42 it says but jesus called them to him and he saith unto them you know that they which are accounted to rule over the gentiles exercise lordship over them and their great ones exercise authority upon them but so shall it not be among you but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister and whosoever of you shall be the chiefest shall be servant of all for even the son of man came to be ministered unto uh, came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many so like i said this isn't some arbitrary thing where god's just trying to you know influence us to serve others right it is a literal spiritual truth that you are more blessed when you give and when you minister to others right like think about it in some some practical sense like uh let's say you're doing a deliverance session you know the the way that you learn to listen to people the patience that you gain the self-control that the opportunity to be able to pray the opportunity to be able to pray for somebody's deliverance could be just as much growth as receiving deliverance in in another in a different sense obviously but in the first place or think about somebody who's preaching in front of a church you know that person could be more blessed why because they have the opportunity unlike anybody in that crowd to overcome fear of man to sharpen their preaching skills you know to to be a blessing to other people right that person preaching has an opportunity unlike anybody else that's listening to that minister to grow a lot more actually in some sense to grow to overcome fear of man like the people who are listening to the message might not now i don't mean to undermine once again receiving like that's obviously utterly important i already preached a message on how we should freely receive uh earlier on in this season of uh of zoom sessions that we're doing right here as well too right like you don't want to be resistant to receiving from god you want to freely receive from god as a, as a gift of grace but let's continue to look at some other passages here and then i think it'll further click in your guys's mind philippians chapter 2 verse 17 through 18 in the nlt says but i will rejoice even if i lose my life pouring it out like a liquid offering to god just like your faithful service is an offering to God. All I want of you is to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice and I will share your joy. What if we're asking God to fill us, but we're not pouring out into others? Our cup should be overflowing and flowing into other people. You know, the Holy Spirit is described as rivers of living water, not necessarily as an ocean or something like that, right? Rivers of, of living water, flowing water. This is how the Holy Spirit wants to operate in our lives as rivers of living water flowing into other people to be a blessing to them. Um, there was one time actually a couple weeks ago where I was praying for a woman and I thought it was such a cool experience. Uh, I prayed for her deliverance, right? And afterwards, I was just saying, God, fill her with joy, joy overflowing, right? That, that phrase just came to me, fill her with joy overflowing. And like instantly after that, right after I said that statement, I felt like a spirit of joy. You know, the Bible does talk about the seven spirits of God. Anyways, I felt joy hit me and I, and I realized, oh, the joy that she's being filled with is like overflowing into me right now. Uh, so this is what this is just one of many things that you can experience as a blessing when you bless others. Edify yourself by edifying others. There's times where I minister and I feel so much joy afterwards, right? Like, and and, and you know what this produces? It produces humility. It produces uh, gratefulness. It produces joy. It helps you to walk in the fruit of the spirit when you have this mind when you have this mindset that you look at it as more blessed to give than to receive when you look at the opportunity to serve others as a blessing not something that you're you're dragging your feet to do even though you might have to drag your flesh to do but you're not dragging your will your will to do right um and this ties in with deliverance seek deliverance by seeking to do god's will you know you could even frame it like this like <laughs> Don't merely seek deliverance, seek to do God's will and the deliverance will just come. 
there's times where people receive deliverance that I've prayed for actually, and they weren't even seeking deliverance at all, at all. They were just seeking to do God's will and they got radical deliverance. There was one time where uh, somebody called me, a man called me, and he was just asking for prayer. Like he was asking for prayer and dealing with his friends or something like that. And I don't think he had any idea of the ministry of deliverance. I mean, I didn't go in depth in asking him about it, but he wasn't asking for deliverance prayer. And so many people reach out to me asking for deliverance prayer. I took it as he wants to do a deliverance session with me, right? There wasn't like super thorough communication about it. So I called him over video chat and I'm like, I'll pray for you. I don't know if I said the word deliverance or not, but I started doing deliverance on him. And he's like, I didn't even know this was going to happen. Like, I was just asking for prayer. And I'm like, oh, I thought you wanted deliverance. You know, and he wasn't even seeking to be delivered. I don't know if he knew anything about deliverance, but he was burping up spirits, getting tons of deliverance for like a half hour, 40 minutes, something like that. And he, and he got a lot of deliverance. So hopefully that example puts into perspective what I'm trying to talk about tonight or one of the things I'm trying to talk about tonight. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's what I can say with regards to deliverance. Seek God, seek to do God's will, and walk in righteousness. And another uh, short passage I wanted to read to you guys here tonight, a cluster of verses. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. It says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even publicans or sinners do the same. The reason why I wanted to read this passage is because it's such a good illustration of what I'm talking about about how being a blessing to others will actually transform you. This passage right here, love your enemies, pray for them. Many people might look at this in the sense of, well, we want them to be saved. We want them to be blessed. We want their hearts to be softened, which are all true objectives of this passage. But sometimes it can actually be what it produces in you. Uh, I like to share this testimony. Some of you may have heard it before. A number of years ago, I was going on a prayer walk around my neighborhood and this random car, maybe not so random <laughs> because we know it was of a spiritual influence, but this, this car pulls up to me and for no reason, they call me uh, the F word, like, a, you know, anyways, I won't say it, but they call me vulgar language, right? And I don't know these people, like they just came up to me and, and I felt bitterness rise up in my heart. But then the Holy Spirit reminded me of Matthew chapter 5 right here to pray for your enemies to love those who are love those who hate you right and I started to pray for them I started to pray for their salvation and I felt joy arise in my heart I don't know if those people got saved I don't know if God moved in their lives but in that situation at least the emphasis I could see on is what it was going to produce in me what it was going to cause in me for me to pray for my enemies to cause me to grow in Christ, to cause me to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. So this is really what's important, is conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. When we're serving God, we will conform to the image of Jesus Christ. You know, in the business or finance world, some may say, like, you're your greatest asset. And similarly is the case with regards to Christianity. Like, you know, what obeying God does in you is sometimes the greatest thing is because it causes you to conform to the image of Jesus Christ. What obeying Jesus Christ does for you is in, in causing you to be more like Jesus Christ is something to take into consideration. When people obey God, I don't think a lot of people take this into consideration, that actually God could have you just obey him just simply for that fact alone sometimes, that you would be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, right? And uh, this is what's really good about you thus being able to serve God, is you become like Jesus Christ. You develop the mind of Christ. You're an imitator of God. All this scriptural language, you have the fruit of the Spirit, and then you will just subsequently serve God, right? This is why the emphasis of a Christian needs to be on this, 
about being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Because when you conform to the image of Jesus Christ, you'll just subsequently naturally serve God. You'll just subsequently naturally submit to God because Jesus Christ uh, did these things. So it'll be naturally what we what we do. But I just wanted to encourage you guys uh, in stepping out in faith and ministering to others in whatever capacity God leads you. Obviously, it doesn't have to be the same as some of the examples that I have given tonight. But everybody, when they start serving God, starts the devil's trying to tie their tongue or the devil's giving them brain fog or inadequacy arises in your heart. Don't look at that as a reason to not do it. Actually, look at that as a reason. Man, I could get a lot of sanctification right here. I could grow right here. And you see how it's more blessed to give than to receive. Because in some sense, it could be not merely or primarily about the people that you're going to go and bless and minister to, but about how much closer you're going to get to God and conform to the image of Jesus Christ. And I want to say this as well, too. Many times when people step out in faith, and they're dealing with anxiety and security, so on and so forth, inadequacy. You, you, it's easy for you to think to yourself, I'm the only one dealing with this. But rest assured, let me tell you, other people deal with anxiety and insecurity in a very similar way. Like you might go out in public and anxiety is attacking you and insecurity, whatever it is, right? Fill in the, the blank with whatever you might be battling. And the devil whispers in your ear like, Look, everybody else is doing fine, but it's a faulty perception of reality, right? Like everybody, if they were placed in a similar situation as you and they hadn't overcome those issues yet, would be dealing with anxiety similarly as well, too. I think it's easy for us to lose sight of like when we're talking with others, they might have those same internal problems even to the same degree as you many times. Now, obviously, in Christ, there's freedom and you get sanctified and you overcome that's the whole point of my message, right? But I'm just talking about where you start and how to overcome. And I want to say that, you know, God gives you grace when you fail. God gives you grace when you might fall short, when you step out and try to minister to others, right? Everybody makes mistakes when they start ministering. I, I believe God put me on a, a on a pretty good foundation starting off in my ministry. I believe that I had, you know, a lot of things doctrinally right. But there were many mistakes, you know, even still, nevertheless, you know, not not to make comparisons, but let me just say, you know, there's there's mistakes in everybody's life when they step out and minister. Obviously, that's not an excuse to blatantly be uh, uh, inconsiderate of doing God's will or blatantly do something that dishonors the name of Jesus. But nevertheless, I think one of the big strongholds that people deal with is a demon that blocks you from bringing your weaknesses before God. Demons that block you from being transparent before God. When you're struggling with insecurities and fears, bring it before God in prayer. Lay it at his feet. Because I wanted to read to you guys this passage now in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. It says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that were given there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. Now, those who would oppose uh, one of the statements I made concerning Paul saying he needed deliverance in the New Testament earlier on, right here, Paul is saying, straightforward, there was a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan. And if you look in the Greek at the word messenger, it's anglos or angel. So Paul is literally saying there was a thorn in his, in his flesh, the messenger of Satan or the angel of Satan. People say, oh, what is this messenger of Satan? Well, it's, 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 it, I mean, it is what it is. It's, the, it's an angel of Satan. It's a fallen spirit. It's an unclean spirit, however you want to word it. It's right there in the language. We don't have to guess. Paul is, Paul is telling us what the thorn is that it's the messenger of Satan, right? So we don't have to guess at what the second statement is because we know the first statement is in correlation to, to uh, what it is, right? And some people might say it's his, it's his infirmities, but Paul went on to say, let me just read it right here. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weaknesses. Most gladly, therefore, 
So therefore, because of this thorn in the flesh and God working with him, I will gl rather glory in my infirmities. That therefore is a preceding statement. It's not explaining what he was previously articulating. He already artic articulated it by explaining what the thorn in the flesh is, uh, an angel of Satan. Anyways, it goes on to say that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure. <laughs> That's so interesting. How many of us look at it as taking pleasure and the trials, tribulations that we may go through, the infirmities, the battles that we might go, go through, and infirmities and reapproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses. And you want to know what else just to drive the point, the home run all the way home? How the thorn in the flesh cannot be in reference to uh, these infirmities that he's describing. Because all of these things are outward things. The infirmities, and I don't believe that's talking about like a, a disease, actually. That's debatable. But anyways, it goes on to say, reapproaches, necessities, persecutions, distresses. These are all external things. So how would that therefore be in reference to the thorn in, the, in his flesh, right? That doesn't make any sense. He's explaining why he can endure even though he has the thorn in the flesh. But anyways, the main point that I wanted to bring this passage up for is if you're noticing weaknesses, you're noticing insecurities arise when you go to step out in faith, it's a great opportunity to rely upon God's strength. Actually, many times when the devil's attacking you in a certain area, it, it kind of reveals something. It reveals where God wants you to grow. Like if you're going to apply for a job and you always feel inadequate, you're going to talk to a family member and you always feel bitter. If there's a certain area that the devil keeps trying to exploit you in, think to yourself, this is an area where God's trying to teach me to rely on his strength. And you want to know what? Demons mo mo a lot of the time start manifesting when you're at that place. When you're at a place in your sanctification where your strength no longer is able to get you through the situation. When your strength is no longer the thing that can sustain you to overcome a situation, that's when you rely upon God's power, right? And that's many times when the demons start manifesting, when you step out of your comfort zone and you need to rely upon God's, upon God's grace. So talk about ministering to others, being a blessing to others, serving others. I hope it makes a lot more sense why I'm communicating what I'm communicating, right? So I just wanted to encourage you guys in the name of Jesus to try to minister to others. Obviously, you don't want to be in blatant sin. Uh, you don't want to be in willful sin while you're ministering to others. You're taking on all kinds of ministry opportunities. But nevertheless, you know, I always, I always think of the passage when Jesus Christ said, you know, he who is faithful will, with little can be trusted with much. Try serving God in the capacity that you can, and it'll snowball into a greater effect. But guys, we don't, we have absolutely zero excuse to not serve God in this day and age. Considering what I just said right now about what it'll do for your sanctification. Think about it, guys. Some of the Christians that you know that are the most uh, spiritually mature, the most on fire for God, however you want to word it. I, I guarantee most of the people that are coming to your mind are people that are actively serving in ministry. I mean, obviously there's nuance to that. But they're, they're people that are actively serving God in, in some capacity. And when I say serve God for clarification, I'm not saying you got to go start a YouTube channel tomorrow or you got to go start street preaching immediately tonight or something, something like that. But nevertheless, um, you know, we have no excuse. We have uh, the Internet today. You can serve God just by typing on your keyboard. Like, think about if the apostles thought about the, the state that we're in today, right? where you could literally preach the gospel, you can minister hope to people, you could uh, pray for people just by picking up your phone and sending a voice recording to somebody, just by typing on your keyboard, you, you can serve God, right? So what an opportunity that we have today. Uh, there's not really an excuse. Um, obviously, you know, there's, there's nuance to that conversation once again, but step out in some capacity. And, and if you don't know, you know, what that looks like, or I always say, guys, like when I first started ministering, I had very little knowledge. I was maybe actually a little too overtly ignorant of some spiritual things at that point. 
but nevertheless, um, it caused me to grow a lot more than I would have if I, uh, if I didn't, right? So I praise God and God works it out, guys. So step out in faith in Jesus' name, be a blessing to others, and you'll notice long term, it'll be such a grand blessing in your life. It is one of the key things for sanctification. One of the key things for your sanctification and thus your deliverance is when you step into God's calling in your life, right? Okay.